Hi everybody, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. Um, I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com. So you'll find information, resources, activities for people who work in and around the global medcoms community, by which I mean people who are working in and around medical education, medical communication, medical publishing, associated businesses. Um, importantly, we also provide a lot of uh, information and support, hopefully, for people who are looking to join our business. Maybe you want to join as a medical writer or account manager or an editor and so on and so forth. You'll find lots of information at first Medcom's job, specifically about trying to provide more insights into the business and guidance and signposts as to where to find more information. Um, we're doing uh, a lot of webcasts um, at the moment and we're, we're recording them along with other videos at Network Pharma TV. So tonight we're having a, a, a webinar, as it were, uh, with Katia. We've got a, a masterclass, as we call it, First Medcom's Job, where we're talking about the right mindset uh, when, you're, when you're going out as a job seeker. We're trying to provide you with some ideas and some thoughts and insights into how to go about um, the job um, application process with people like Katia who've been in the business and now support people through training and coaching and so on. So we're going to have a little presentation from Katia, then we're going to have an, uh, an open Q&A. So those of you in the audience tonight, please get ready to contribute. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Katia to introduce herself and talk through a presentation. Over to you, Katia. Lovely. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, so my name's Katia Chrysostomo, and um, I support people with um, job applications and interviews. And my earlier life, in my earlier life, I actually was uh, a client services, project manager, project editor in medical publishing and medical communications, medcoms. Um, so I've kind of seen the, the world from both sides, inside and outside. Um, and actually one of, the, one of the reasons why I really like being part of your activities, Peter, is actually providing that career support for people who want to get into the industry and people who are in the industry. It's certainly something I didn't have when I joined and um, it, I, I can't think of a better service to be able to provide people. They go in informed. And hopefully this uh, talk a little adds to that a little bit. Um, I'll be sharing one of the uh, coaching models that I use when I'm doing my coaching uh, in terms of an effective mindset. Uh, and I'll talk you through that and the steps that I think that can make the difference between you know, a worrying mindset or an effective mindset. I'll share some sc the screen with you so I can go through my slides. Lovely. So we've got that. So you can see that. OK. Uh, so before we start, I kind of wanted to talk through the sort of steps that we have when you're looking for a new job or a new career. Um, picked out some of the key elements, drafting a CV, research, searching for the job, applying in the interview process. And it'd be really interesting when we get to the questions part to hear from the audience, the sorts of places where they have the most challenges. If you think about, you know, you're decided you want to change career you have to take the steps towards getting that new career. What are the big problems and the big barriers that are in your way to get to that career? Um, I outlined that there's just some of the stages, but I would like to come back to that at the end and talk to people a little bit about the challenges that they see. Um, but today I want to talk about um, the mindset model that I use when I do my coaching. And I have split it off into a nice little Venn diagram for the scientists out there. Uh, and I've split it off into three different areas. And the star in the middle is getting the job. And for me to get the job, you need to get it right in all these three areas. You, the how you show your fit and motivation for the role. And then the green circle is the right opportunity. That actually going for the right opportunity in the first place is probably the most important thing to, you know, if you've got your ladder up against the wrong wall, you're, you're not going to be taking the right steps. And then the third, the blue, is the employer meeting the employer's needs through the hiring process. Um, and I actually use this when I'm in my coaching sessions, when I'm thinking about the problems that come to me. And quite often the problem might be a problem with a CV or interview prep. But actually, I like to think below that and under, get underneath that and think about what the problems, where the problems are actually coming from. So I think you get much better solutions. I also think this model also is quite helpful in thinking about some of the barriers and frustrations that people have when they're um, looking at either changing career or going for another job. And I'd like to just take a minute on that. And I think this is something that isn't really spoken about, but I think it's actually really important. And these are, I call them invisible barriers. They're all these things that seem 
to get in the way when you want to go for a new job, you're trying to change career. And this just seems to be all these sort of invisible barriers in front of you that are stopping you. So if I go around my model again, if I start with the green, which is the opportunity, if you think about somebody who's trying to get, let's say, into medcoms, either as a, a junior writer or as an experienced professional who's coming out of academia, actually, you're still trying to get into an industry where there are a lot of unknowns about the industry itself, the different sorts of companies that you could work for, the different sorts of jobs that you could do, even recognizing the difference between uh, job titles where two jobs can be very different and have the same job title, or they could have completely different job titles and be very similar jobs. So you're trying to compete and you're trying to apply for in a world where there's actually lots of things you don't understand, lots of unknowns. If we go to the blue circle, which is the, the employer, I mean, there, I think opaque is the best word to describe uh, the relationship with an employer. If you think about all the times when I hear this a lot, I, I got rejected and I didn't know why. Uh, and I think there it's the sense that you have no understanding of what goes on behind the scenes. So you're trying to apply for a job and you're being re rejected, but you've got no understanding of what goes on behind the scenes. Who is the person who is reviewing and rejected your CV? Who is making the hiring decisions? Are there internal candidates that perhaps uh, front runners? So therefore you didn't stand a chance. There may be issues around challenges uh, with the company itself that might be driving why they're looking for a certain type of person or a particular culture which influences the type of person they're looking for. But again, these are all invisible to you. you. You have no access, no control over any of these elements. Um, then the third point, the yellow, what I have is the yellow circle, which is really your invisible competition. And there again, if you're competing for a role, you don't get the role and you're wondering who you're comparing yourself against. You don't know how much your career history uh, was very, very different to the person who got the role. What, what were your strengths? What were your weaknesses? Were there any particular gaps that really made that difference? There's no feedback, there's no information to know. So all in all, I think this model for me highlights quite nicely lots of the frustrations that job applicants have. And I'll be very interested to hear at the end whether you recognize any of these frustrations, that there just seems to be all these things in your way, getting in your way when you're trying to change a role or change a job. So that's why I want to use this mindset model, because I actually think that the antidote to these invisible barriers, the lack of control, and I'll go on to the steps that you can take, is actually focusing on what you can control. And for me, that's the first step in terms of an effective job seekers mindset. There are, we've talked about the things that you have no control over, you know, you'll, you never have any control over. And then there's, I think, three key areas where you do have control. And I'll go through, I'll go around them and explain what I mean. So between the yellow circle, you, and the green circle, the opportunity that you're going for, is your job hunt strategy. So that is basically the process by which you research, choose, and select the job that you're going to go for. That's where you have control. If we look between the opportunity and the employer, I've got a section called make selection easier. And basically that's how you get yourself into the yes pile. You've got control over getting yourself into the yes pile rather than into the no pile. For example, because you didn't put the right reference number or there were typos in your application or you missed a really important um, criteria that they needed for that particular role. And then the third element where you have control in this process are your employability skills. And I put the employability skills between the employer and you, because actually, if most of the skills in it, most of the skills that you talk about are your job skills, the skills that you need doing your job. Employability skills are very specific and they are the skills that help you get a job. So they're actually two very different things. So by that, I mean, writing a CV, 
doing your cover letter interview performance. Um, and, I, and I think by narrowing it down to those three areas, I think it moves you away from worrying about what you don't have control over. And we can start thinking about what you do have control over so that you can then look to get your next job. And I'll go through this in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to break this down a little bit so we can give you some examples. And as you can see along the top of this slide, I've split it into the three areas, the job hunt strategy, making selection easier and uh, the employability skills. Um, and my advice in each of those is the next level down. So research and planning, clues and information and the, um, the learning and developing, improving your skills. And I'll give you some examples because I think it would be quite helpful to go through so that rather than just telling you what you should do, I can actually help you see maybe you can think about elements that you can use when you're thinking about perhaps how you can take control over your, um, your next going for your next job. So if we could look at the research and planning, uh, the first element is network and your channels such as LinkedIn. And I think that for those of you here, then you've probably got a big tick in the ne networking box already being part of Peter's career group. Um, hopefully you're part of other groups as well, where you're learning about the jobs you want to go for or getting into medcoms, what it's going to be like, the sorts of companies that you could be working for. Uh, but I think it's really important. I mean, if Peter's got, well, I keep going on about Peter, but he's got fantastic resources you know, amazing, the website is amazing. Um, first Medcom jobs, uh, particularly for people who want to get in it for the first time that don't know anything about Medcoms. But I would say, don't stop there. You have to look wider and interacting, for me is interacting with people is m as important as just looking at uh, videos, brilliant videos about agencies, but it's actually getting out there and speaking to people so you can do proper research, find out what it's like, What's life like in a company? You know, what's, what's a particular role like? What's a particular job like? So that brings us on to the second point, which is the criteria for the right role. And I think very early on, you need to be thinking about what is it that you actually want from a role and, and really honing that down. You can't just go by job descriptions, because as I said, the job descriptions are so varied and they can be so, you know, very, very different things in different companies. But I think by identifying the type of role that you want and the type of elements of the role that you want, that will help put you in more of in a control over what you're looking for. It will help your research. And ultimately, it will mean that you're going for the right sort of opportunities, because that's the most important thing. If you're not going for the right opportunities, then if you've got the ladder up against the wrong wall and you're going in the wrong direction. Um, the third example here is the plans, the planning, there's probably lots of plans you need to do to, to take control. I've given two examples here. One is gaps. What are the gaps that you have to fix if you need to go, if you're somebody, for example, a junior writer who wants to get into writing in medcoms, are there any skills that you need to fix? Uh, are there, if you've come from another industry, are there any skills, any gaps that you need to fill? So that you start planning ahead. The second one is, uh, the transition, it may not be that you're ready for the move now, it might be that you're ready for a move in a year's time. But actually, one of the things that you can control is how you plan that transition, what you do beforehand, what stages need to happen by what time frame. So those all fall into the first category of taking control of your job hunt strategy so that you're informed and you're prepared. The middle section about making selection easier. For me, uh, clues and information, I, probably this is the, one of the most common areas where I think you could immediately see a benefit just by filling the advice in this uh, column. Because I, I often see that um, this is the bit that's missing, that I think people don't take advantage. There's lots of things they don't know. But I see in my coaching sessions, there's lots of times where the client hasn't taken advantage of information that's available. And there's three areas for that. The first is the job spec criteria. This is the criteria that you see when you have a, 
the job spec with the um, advert. Uh, I actually do a webinar just on that. It's, so it's that important. But I think there are lots and lots of clues within that. That will help you see how you fit with a role, how your skills fit the, with the role, how you can translate your experience. And I, th I think that's often not used enough. Typically, a candidate will skim through it, look at the some of the key elements, and then go off and write their CV, do their application, do their cover letter. And that almost gets left behind, possibly until the interview stage. So I think that's a really important one. Uh, the other area is the employee information, the instructions, career info on websites. And this is another area where quite often I'll contact a candidate and say, oh, did you know that on their website they have this information? Or did you see this additional document which describes some of their requirements? And often that's been missed. And so those are, these might sound like little details, obvious details, but if you're thinking about taking control and getting ahead of other candidates, then if you're doing these things, you are putting yourself in front of another candidate that hasn't done those things. And you're making it easier for the employer to select you. The third element is it, the insider knowledge using LinkedIn and other resources to find out about a company, about a role. You can get, you can find people who know people who know people who know somebody that works in the company that you're working for, particularly with uh, Peter's network. It's not difficult to do that. And with that little bit of insider knowledge, you can perhaps identify some of the gaps that you've got, find out a little bit more about the employer. You can do all these things that actually just put you one step ahead of somebody else who hasn't done that. So this is all about taking control. And these are sort of the ways that you can take control. The third element is the employability skills. And for me, these are really important because this isn't just a one-off activity. I think quite often, uh, I don't know how you feel, it'd be interesting to get your feedback. Job applicants, you know, you do the process of doing a job and then you uh, applying for a job and then you kind of put it to one side and think, oh, thank goodness, I don't have to do that for another couple of years and kind of forget everything that you've learned. But actually, employability skills are a skill in their own right and actually something that will improve your career throughout your career. And it'll only get harder as you go for better jobs and you, you know, you're competing with other people that have got experience. So I would say in terms of you taking control, think of your employability skills as a skill that you carry with you, not just a, ta a task related thing you have to do. And I've listed here some of the things that are employability skills. One is the ability to describe what you do in terms of your achievements, or I call them evidence, but evidence for your abilities. Uh, the second, translating skills and experience. And I, and I purposely use translate and not transferable. Normally you see the term transferable skills. But actually I think it's much better to think of translating everything you do. Would the employer understand what you mean by that skill? Would the employer understand what you mean by that experience that you've had? It's actually stepping into the employer's world and showing your skills from the employer's perspective rather than just describing them. Uh, the third point, point are the sort of star, the competency answers. Again, we could talk about the star answers at the end if anybody's interested, but these are the typical sorts of questions you get asked at interview. Tell me a time when type questions. And again, that's a skill, actually describing those, you know, understanding how you could build those up to show you off to the best of your ability. And then finally, the sorts of exercises or activities that you might have to do through the interview process. And we've spoken before about writing tests. I think when you've had one of your masterclasses, Peter, on um, you know, how to do a writing test, you can find information, you can get better at these things. So this is a little summary, I think, of how you take control. And this is summarized, I say, the key things are summarized in this table. So the second step, I think, for taking control is focusing on some key questions. And I've plotted these questions out using my little, uh, my little model, because it kind of overlaps. Firstly, why you? And, and when I mean why you, I don't mean your career history of 10, 20, 30 years, everything packed into a CV. I mean, why you 
what is the evidence for the skills that you have to be able to do the job that's being asked of you? So very, very specific. Uh, in the green circle, well, why this job now? Very, very important, particularly if you're changing careers, if you want to come into medcoms, you have to show the employer why you want to do this particular role and why at this point of your career. There, be, there may be people entering medcoms, you may be very new in your, very junior in your career. You actually might be very experienced if you're uh, from academic academia and you're a postdoc. You might have many years, even decades of experience. But that question is still important. Why this job, why now? And then finally, the last question is, why this company? And for me, that's showing the employee you understand their world. And if you can answer those three questions, then you increase your chances of getting seen, getting interviewed, potentially getting the, the job. And when I say about answering these questions, I don't mean preparing something at the end ready for an interview. My advice is, if you want to get ahead of other applicants, is thinking about these questions before you've applied. And that sounds like a lot of work, but I think it has two functions. One, it makes you think whether you want, if you can be bothered to do this, it makes you think whether you want the job. And I actually think that's really important when you're putting yourself through this process. It's a two-way thing. Do you want the job, not just does the employer want you? Um, and secondly, it gets you prepared. It creates the story that you have consistently throughout your application and then through the interviews. So you're not having to do this at the end um, as part of your interview preparation. So I think those are two, um, three really important questions that will help you be more in control of what you're doing. And then finally, so kind of getting to the end of this now, really the third element is keep going. I know that sounds really obvious, but actually resilience and to keep going, they may, you may get rejections, you may not get the response that you want, is the only way for you to take control over your next career step. And actually a, an effective job seekers mindset is one that will keep going that's resilient. And I've broken that down into three different areas. Uh, firstly, dream bolder, I mean, not underselling yourself, really going for the well-informed, going for the roles, the best roles that you can get. What you do now influences your career in the future, so getting the best role you can is really important. Um, applying smarter, performing better, you can improve what you do in terms of your application and how you apply for jobs. And then succeeding faster, that's really about troubleshooting and fixing uh, when things go wrong, when they don't go your way, so that you can then take the next step the next time. And I think those three things are really important elements. This is a long, this may be a long game. It's not just, you know, one application here, one application there, and you just have to keep going. But the point I would say is that you don't have to keep going alone. And that, I think that's really important. Peter's got lots of resources. If Peter's talking about you, you again, um, you know, there, there are ways to get information to help you. You should be looking at your network, friends and families. Uh, you know, um, my niece wanted to get into advertising and um, we suddenly realized that somebody my sister who was at college with actually works in an advertising agency. We hadn't thought about that before. And a lot of times these sorts of things don't necessarily come up until, until you start exploring them and asking asking your network if they know somebody. Do you know somebody who's worked in this company? Do you know somebody that's worked in that company? So this isn't just about working by yourself. This is getting other people involved. And obviously the other areas working with one-to-one um, -one with professionals as well, but there are lots of different ways that you can help, people can help you to keep going so that you get what you want. So kind of this brings me back round to the, the first slide really, which is, you know, this is the mindset that we're talking about. And I'd be really interesting to know after this talk, whether anyone has any, has changed what they would focus on or what they see as the barriers to getting a new job. So that'd be really interesting the questions, whether there's any difference in 
how you see, what you focus on, what's important, and how you would take control to get uh, a job. And then just coming up to the end, I wanted to just summarize, because there were quite a lot of bits, and just really summarize it in a way that people, if they want to take a picture, if you want to just do a sort of snapshot of the key areas, so that you've got the model and then the steps for taking control and then some of the examples so that you've got that all in one place. Did I leave it up long enough? Do I need to leave it up a little bit longer? Okay. And then just finally, um, my LinkedIn contact details, if anybody wants to get in touch and I can do some, uh, so I've got some spaces for some short consultations if anybody wants any feedback on uh, CVs, cover letters and things like that. And then I'll hand back to Peter. Brilliant. Thanks, Katia. Let me stop sharing that. Leave the slides. That's perfect. That's great. Thank you very much. Some good practical advice in there. I think with anything like this, what I what I think when I'm listening to you talking is that I would be rubbish at applying for a job these days. I mean, and I, you know, in the good old days, you know, if I went for a job, I was just winging it all the way, you know. Um, and when I was looking for a job, there wasn't all the resources that you could tap into anyway, sort of thing. But I'm very bad at thinking things through a little bit and trying to understand what I need to do to get somewhere and I'm very much more gut feel um but a, a comment a theme that was right through that which I think is really important to um to emphasize and it's the thing that I hear people talking about is the biggest mistake people make you know when you're sitting in an interview or you're going through the process and what you find you're ending up doing is talking about why you want to leave where you are I want to get out of the lab I just I'm whatever and it's what you need to be thinking about is why you want to join whoever it is you're talking to, because yeah. otherwise it's not making sense to that person. And you need to think that process through. And whatever models you've provided, some models, some tools there, there are others. It's just, it's just, if people can be helped to think about the importance of thinking this through, that will be useful, is, is the way I look at it. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, it may not, if you think you may have three or four different people applying for that role, Obviously, if the person you're applying against, your competition, mm -hmm. your invisible competition, has skill sets coming out of areas that you could only dream of, obviously, you may not get the role. But in many cases, the, the decision may come down to how much do you want this job and how much do you want to work in this company? And that might be the difference between mm, should we, would they, are they really that interested? You know, those, that's... In terms of taking control, that's where you have control. You don't have control. And that's why I wanted to separate where you have control and where you don't. You don't have control whether five other people are going to be more experienced with you when you apply. No control over that at all. What you do have control over is how you present, how you articulate your skills, and then how much you convince them that actually you do want this job and you do want this to work with this employer. And I think that, that it's those nuances. I think you know it's around the edges where you've got control, um, and that can make the difference. Absolutely, and there's nobody perfect out there, is there? We we no. we sort of kid ourselves that we must be up against somebody perfect, but we're not. So so as you say, understanding what you're trying to do, understanding the the person you're talking to, which leads into the whole research thing. I mean, let's just talk about that for a moment. Um, as I say, I'm I'm old enough to remember the days when you had no access to anything. You turned up at a job interview, not knowing. Yeah anything about anything yeah whereas these days there's a there's a wealth of information um i just wonder whether you've got any views on how far you go so you know obviously you research the company you can research their websites you can etc cetera, etc cetera. how far do you go i mean i would i suppose i would be saying if you know who's going to be interviewing you you should be on linkedin checking yeah. them out um they're going to be checking you out you check them out but how you know do you, do you, do you you're agreeing with me Totally. Do you just think and that's a simple totally you know, but also as as you can. it's the the friend who knows a friend who knows a friend that works there finding out you find out about the culture and this is a two-way this is a it's trying to make um interviews a two-way process that the you know i have heard often i don't if i was offered the job i don't know whether i would take it and i think if you've got to the point i mean fantastic to be offered a job but if you get to the point where you don't know whether you would uh, accept the job if you've been offered it, then you've not done the work, the right work in the right place. Uh, so, you know, there's two ends. There's then not knowing whether you, you can get the job and not knowing whether you want the job. 
but finding out what's it like to work in you know what's the place like what are their issues what sort of team does it suit you does it suit the way you work there's only so much that a job spec will tell you it's trying to understand between the lines what life will look like in that job if you're sitting in that chair at that desk what will life look like so that's that when you say you know what else can you research for me that's that's what i'm thinking you know how do i how do i work out through my interviews through the application process through linkedin finding out who's interviewing me what is life going to look like there because i've then got to decide whether i'm going to spend the next x years doing that job if I'm in a fantastic situation where I can choose between two jobs, they both offer me that's even better, but I now need to compare and decide which of these two jobs would I go for. So that for me, that's the research. If you're new to an industry, you might need to understand the, re the industry better. You know, it may not just be the, the um, employer. You might need to understand the sector they're in or the industry they're in or the segment that they're in to understand you'll have a knowledge gap you need to know what your knowledge gap is going to be if you've not worked in that industry before you and only then you can mitigate that a bit at an interview or demonstrate your ability to make up the gap if you go in blind then you don't know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and i think um uh, is this the right way to say this um i think you can do that research you can you can try and be too clever and you can sort of you know if you're coming to an interview with me you can sort of check me out you know and, and and on the basis that you know you oh yeah and you can bring it into the conversation oh yeah something about bristol university or something like that and then you can sort of you can go oh hang on a second how do you know that <laughs> but if you're but that's sort of you know that you're sort of making that a bit obvious but but having checked me out you can you definitely would have a different conversation with me than if you just were yes. blind blind and it's a, it's the confidence and it's the tuning in and it's the you don't have to go oh and <laughs> I'm clever enough to check this out and I know this about you. Yeah. It's just having that conversation and, and watching the webinars. I mean, I happen to do a lot of these webinars and stuff, which I just think are really useful because people can just sit and they can listen and they can hear people talking. It doesn't matter so much what they're saying. It's just getting a sense of the sorts of people, the sort of business and so on. Um, and that's really useful and it tunes you in. Go on a course, you know, join in with some of our events or whatever, other people's events and just tune yourself in. You don't have to become an expert. Nobody expects you to know all the no, answers, but, you, but if you become involved, you start to tune in and then that comes over in terms of you positively and confidently exactly. talking to somebody. Yeah. I mean, part of the thing you, with your um, interviews with the different agencies, when they talk about different projects they've done or different works or the type of way they work, it might also give you ideas that you hadn't considered before. You know, we all talk about entering medcoms, medical writer, client services, editorial, maybe design you know so it's quite we, we we're talking quite limited silos buckets yes. yeah silos but actually there's a whole world out there of um specialist agencies uh you know different types of roles things that different people that are quite you know that anybody could do things that only specialists with medical background people could do but actually until you understand the wealth of that you'll only ever be looking at am i a writer am i editor or am i client services and i think that's too limiting for uh, medcoms and there's just so many more opportunities out there the, the, i mean that that the, the, there is a practical problem though because when you're when you're talking about it you end up having to sort of talk in terms of silos and, and so on yeah. you know and i think that's where the networking side of it is really important and if you get to if you can go to some of the face-to-face -face type meetings or networking type sessions if you can reach out via linkedin or something to people and have different sorts of discussions in different ways then again it gives you a better picture if somebody is presenting something exactly. to you you end up labeling and siloing and whatever um the other thing i mean the thing about medcoms just 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 making a couple of very general points about medcoms and people trying to get into medcoms um, a very common message that that comes over from what i do with the sorts of activities i do from people in in, in medcoms is, is reach out to us um, there is a sort of an assumption that none of these people will talk to you and you might be right <laughs> you know we're yeah. all very busy they're all very busy but something like linkedin is a magic way of reaching out to people and showing some interest and, and catching people's eyes and actually in, in, a, in a business like medcoms i know i'm uh, slightly biased i don't know what the right word is but you know there's a lot of quite decent people in medcoms and they will be helpful and it's surprising if you reach out to 
people in and around the business, how many will go, yeah, sure, no, let's have a chat about it or something. Very, exactly. very useful. But if you can get to the face-to-face -face meetings and if you can start to talk to different people, one of my great things is I have a careers meeting. I look, you know, I have 10 agencies there, you know, you talk to each of them and you realize what we're talking about, that all the agencies are very different. You, you want to understand how those differences play out in real life. You know, a medical writer is not the same in every place, as you said it, yourself. Exactly. You can't, people. you can't just go by the role. So just looking for I'm going to go for medical junior medical writer roles or, you know, you, you just that's too limiting. And actually, there may be very different roles that maybe have the elements that you're looking for, particularly if experienced, you've come from another industry where you have a lot of the skills. You know, there's much more, it's much more nuanced than just there is one type of role and that will be the same in every single agency. And again, this is just putting, it's this idea of putting you in as the applicant in control, giving some elements of control back in a process which is mostly out of your control. And, and as I say, either opaque or invisible or unknown to you. Uh, so I think that's where, you know, this is this is what we're focusing on with this, is that those areas of control. Well, well just out of interest, one of the criticisms um, I hear a lot is people trying to get a job in medcoms and, and you touched on it, you know, you're getting a rejection email with no real backup. There's no feedback. There's no nothing. Um, it's hugely frustrating. Uh, things like writing tests, just being told, thank you, but no. And you go, well, I have no idea what I did or didn't do that. I just wonder whether you've got any words of wisdom or comment or feedback. You know, it is it is difficult. And I sort of understand. I've had arguments with people in medcoms and, and the typical answer is, well, we're just so busy and all the rest of that. And I should say, and I do say very clearly um, that there are agencies out there who are making a big fuss about the fact that they are trying very hard to give feedback to people go through the, you know yeah. so it's not that everyone's doing this but a common complaint is we don't get feedback um, and I sort of understand I know everyone's busy but I think it's a huge shame yeah and I just wonder what words of wisdom or advice or well I would words of wisdom I don't know I would actually slightly disagree with you there because I, I think to some extent there is a there is a limit let me see if I can word this rightly there is a limit to what any agency can say to you when they say no that is going to be any help to you whatsoever unless you do those elements of the research getting the clues and improving your skills so i'd actually argue it's very difficult for an agency to not only provide constructive feedback as why you didn't but to provide you enough information that will help you get over the hurdle the next time because also the next time is a different company and a different opportunity and my little model is you the opportunity and the company? The employer can only have, can only talk to you about the opportunity. What he can't do is tell you whether you went for the right opportunity in the first place, or whether your skills are good. Do you see? So, I, I totally get that frustration, and that's why I kind of want to get people thinking about instead of thinking about all these things barriers as frustrations, recognizing that they're built into the system to some extent. It'd be lovely if they could change a bit, but. I'd actually argue there's nothing that somebody could tell you that would help you. The only way you can help yourself is by taking control of those three areas in terms of how you go for the job in the first place, how you present yourself to that job, and then your skills actually through the hiring process. Okay. So that's All a bit, right, so okay. that's kind of coming at what you're saying from a, a completely different, and I'd love to get feedback and people might disagree with me and, and I, that'd be absolutely fine, but I just really think that worrying about whether or not somebody can give you the right sort of feedback takes all the power away from you puts it onto the employer and you'll never get what you want they'll never get anything really helpful i think it's out of their ability to give you something helpful okay okay how about that for controversial okay. answer good, well no that's but that's interesting it's thinking about it a little bit differently to what i was thinking about because yeah. um i suppose and it does depend a little bit i guess what i'm talking about you know if you take a if you take a medical writing test where you could probably get some useful feedback, arguably, yeah, um, in terms of how you've gone about that test, whether you've answered the brief or not and things like this, it might be very simple. But but no, I mean, I, I understand the point you're making and that, that's interesting. It's a little bit different to the way I was looking at it. Um, so that's that's good. Um, a question came in and, and has gone straight out of my brain. That's annoying because I was, was going to ask you. about... Um, 
Why this job now? Why this? Oh, that's well, Joan, you pick up on Joan's question there. Go on. Can you? Can yeah. You so, why me? this job now? A few exa a few examples. Difficult because obviously it depends on who's going for what particular role. But if you think you're you're coming into a particular, so I'm thinking about this particularly from a career change uh, view. Obviously, if somebody's going for a promotion, that the the step may look more obvious to an employer. So I'm thinking about career change. You've been working to uh, 10 years in uh, industry X and you want to now move across to medcoms into this particular role. You might want to change the role and the industry. I'm not gonna be able to give you an exact answer to this, but the question is, why do you want to do this role? Let's say if it's a more, you've had to take a step down. So now you have to explain why you want to do, let's say a more junior role to the one you were doing before. If you're able to articulate the benefit of why you want to take that step, you may be able to convince somebody to take you on. If you can't, you will leave the employer with the, the concern that you are over, I'm overqualified for the role. You get the rejections, well, sorry, you're overqualified. For me, that means, you haven't thought about why you want that role and the employer doesn't understand why you want that particular role. So Joan, I can't actually give you a sentence answer because it depends what role you're going for and who you are and what company and all those things. For me, it's the principle of why. You have to know for yourself first, why are you, let's say, going for a role that's um, a step down, a more junior? You were a senior manager, now you're gonna go to just a, a manager role. What is it? What is it in that role that you want to do? So you could say, perhaps, I want to do this role so that I can develop in this area. So the person understands that you are taking, you are sacrificing a pay cut, you're sacrificing a job level cut because you want to get into this particular area and that will allow you to grow into that area. But I think you have to make a very clear explanation of why you want to step into that role does that make sense think, yeah yeah and most I just people think, again, don't the talking. most people sorry peter most people don't even i'm applying for the above mentioned role you know standard cover letter might look like you know i'm applying for the above, above measured role i have all these skills blah 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 and you list all your skills but for me I, if i was reading that as an employer i think but why did this person with all this experience want to do this role that's more junior to them i haven't made that link you have to make that link for the employer so they understand why is this person with 20 years, 30 years experience maybe taking a role that's more junior rather than they will understand that I want to get into this company and that's why I'm willing to take, you know, you, you, you can't make these sorts of assumptions. You have to state those assumptions. In my opinion, that's how that's the advice that I would give. Okay. Yes, okay. the answer has I to be very more... convincing. So Jones just answered. I agree. The answer has to be very convincing. And, that, and I agree with what Joan is saying. That's what it has to be. You can't just assume somebody will think they've taken a pay cut or a, a career step down. Therefore, it must be that they really want this role. And, and what's going through my mind, which is an important point, which often comes up in these sorts of questions or sessions is, you know, an experienced academic, for instance, maybe a yeah. postdoc or whatever. Um, very often the conversation is around well why can't i come in a principal medical writer role or something because i've done all these publications and and what we need them to understand is you're going to have to come in at the bottom essentially because you're going to have to learn your trade um and and i think what i i guess following from what you're saying what you want to know is that they understand that and if they understand that they want to come into this business and they understand they're going to have to start at the bottom of the oral stage one if you like um and 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 if there's that understanding there and they want to learn the business and progress and then of course the opportunity in reality is if all that work experience can mean you can move through the ranks very quickly but yeah. but one of the problems is people go but i must be able to start very senior because i've got x years experience but you're not experienced in medcoms so that's a that's a yeah. conflict you need to something. demonstrate and if if you don't say anything there's the you may have already thought that through if you don't articulate don't in a cover letter or upfront in an interview, the employer may always have that question. Maybe they're applying for it, but they're not too sure they're going to get in and then I'm gonna have difficulties because perhaps uh, I'm gonna be asking them to do things which are quite junior to their role. So for me, 
you've got to be clear that you want to take the step. You then have to articulate that step, that, cl that clarity, so that the employer is clear, rather than just assuming that because you applied, I wouldn't have applied if I didn't want it, isn't good enough. You have to articulate yeah. why you're applying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Um, I'm, I'm going to draw the line. I think there's some, some good practical advice in there. I hope this is put, put the thought. Um, I'm going to draw the line there for the recording. Um, I know you're very happy for people to contact you. Yes, definitely. Via LinkedIn is a very easy way of doing it. But you've also provided your website address and so on if people want to follow that up. Um, and um, and I would encourage people to do part, partly the point of these webinars is to go look. Katia is interested in talking to you and has, has some experience here which might be relevant to you. So please follow that up. Thank you to those members of the audience who've joined in. Um, yeah. Don't all run away if you're in the audience tonight um, because we will carry on for another 10 minutes or so. But from, from the recording point of view, I'm going to draw a line there. I'm going to encourage people to go and look at firstmedcomsjob.com, which has been mentioned a couple of times. There's lots of resource there and more generally at medcomsnetworking.com. I'm very happy to help if I can. Um, but uh, certainly the point is go talk to Katia and, and look at her resources and her services services if you can um, uh, and um, and she'll help where she can so I'm just finding the stop recording button but I'm going to say thank you very much Katia just give a little wave and we'll stop the recording and say good luck to everybody take care bye